Accessing art. Attention viewers, Big Jack Films is unavailable at the moment due to missing in action. But he has left a recording before his absence for you to enjoy. The following is a fan-based video review under fair use. All copyrighted clips and music are owned by their respective owners and distributors. Please support the official home media and streaming releases. What's up? It's Big Jack Films here, and welcome back to another review and another Let's Talk. Well, it's award season around this time, folks. The stars are out, the red carpets are rolling, and all of Tinseltown waits to be handed the golden trophies of this year's best in cinema and entertainment. But if there's one award show that brings out the best of the best, it of course would be the Academy Awards. Starting in the earliest days of cinema in 1928, the Academy Awards, or Oscar for short, have been a massive standard in the industry for almost a hundred years, shining a light on the greatest achievements film has to offer. The categories range from all forms of the industry, costume design, art direction, musical scores, actors and visual effects onwards, and most notably, the best picture wins. The first was 1928's Wings, but onwards created and formed some of cinema's best and overall classics. Hell, some of my favorite movies ended up winning the Oscars from One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, Braveheart, and the one that honestly deserved it 100%, The Lord of the Rings, The Return of the King. And off topic, personally my favorite nominations were more in the technical aspects, from art direction, makeup, sound design, and of course, visual effects. Though, to be fair, my favorite movie, King Kong, didn't really get any nominations back in 1934. Well, that's not entirely true. Both the 76 remake and the Peter Jackson film both were nominated respectively for visual effects. Though, 76 was tied with Logan's Run in 1977. And to be fair, the Oscars did recognize the original King Kong in a little presentation in 1998, giving major shoutouts to the film's star, Faye Ray. He would climb the Empire State Building and capture the heart of a beautiful woman while swatting down planes with a flick of his hairy hand. It was not Jack Palance. It was the greatest ape of all, King Kong. I bring this up because when am I ever going to talk about the Oscars and King Kong in one sentence again? I was first introduced to the Oscars on a late night in the late 90s, living in Wisconsin, and had no idea what kind of nightly event on television I was about to witness. All I remember was seeing comedian Billy Crystal Mike being placed in dozens of movie scenes in a very JonTron-esque fashion. Hell, Oscars, if you want another host in the Crystal style, just get JonTron. He'd bring in the crowds like crazy. Still can't believe it myself sometimes. 
But surprisingly enough, it was my first exposure to the ability to insert yourself essentially into the worlds of movies. And while I don't watch the Oscars like I used to, given how much of the political jokes and how it's almost become a presidential campaign in terms of electing damn movies for nominations, I was an avid viewer for a long time and loved the Broadway-esque presentations and montages of the movies it brought to the event. However, there was one segment of the show that fascinated me and actually pushed the boundaries of what was possible with animation and special effects. That, of course, being animation at the Oscars. Now, I'm not necessarily talking about the nominations for short or feature-length animation. I'm talking about the amazing use of animated presenters showcasing the nominations and winners. To me, this was a technique that blew my balls off as a young imaginative kid, and not only tricked me to think these characters were real, but later made me question how the hell they did that in such a short period of time without knowing who was nominated and who won. Well, I guess the best place to start was in the golden age of Hollywood. Animated characters have been guests at the Academy Awards as far back as 1932, when Walt Disney was commissioned with an animated short to be presented with Mickey Mouse leading the parade of award nominees. The same year animated cartoons were first recognized with the Best Short Cartoon category, which was later retitled as Best Animated Short Film. Later on in 1939, Walt would receive a special Academy Award for his outstanding feats with the first animated feature of cinema, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, presented by Golden Age child star, Shirley Temple. Aren't you proud of it, Mr. Disney? Well, I'm so proud, I think I'll bust. <laughs> in 1944, Bugs Bunny famously crashed the ceremony in the Merry Melodies cartoon, What's Cookin', Doc?, directed by Bob Clampett. While animated characters and cartoons of that era took a jab here or there at the Oscars, it was mostly aimed at Hollywood as a whole. But it would take several decades before the actual cartoon stars could attend and present the Oscars for the nominees. This was mostly due to the advent of television and various chroma key technologies that needed to be invented. But by 1978, at the 50th Academy Awards ceremony, the orchestra played the Mickey Mouse Club March, and a costume Mickey Mouse character in a tuxedo walked on stage. While not animation, and given you'd see this guy at Disneyland on a regular basis, it was actually a massive breakthrough to have a fictional character at the awards. Hell, the same year Star Wars was nominated for a ton of awards, including Best Picture, and the stage was filled with the cast and creatures of George Lucas's epic masterpiece. Which, unfortunately, the movie didn't win Best Director nor Best Picture, which was kind of left a stain on George Lucas's resume for decades onwards. An award your little friend George Toy Boy Lucas has never, and will never, win. Bones. Oh, sick burn. After announcing he was there to award the Oscar for Best Animated Short, thanks to a live voiceover by Mickey's official voice at the time, Jimmy McDonald, who was backstage, Mickey was joined on stage by singer-songwriter Paul Williams as co-presenter, along with a recent newcomer to Hollywood, actress Jodie Foster. Williams complimented Mickey on Steamboat Willie, and joked that maybe that he would get Mickey two more fingers for his 50th birthday being celebrated that year. Mickey then announced all the nominations, with the winner being the Sandcastle. Someday I'm gonna buy that blue trash of ass! <laughs> In 1979, Robin Williams handed an honorary Oscar to animator Walter Lance for Woody Woodpecker. Would you like to meet Woody? Well, you mean he's not at Michael's pub? He's here tonight? <laughs> yes, he's here. Wonderful. Yeah, I have, I have one question I'd like to ask. Is it true what the National Enquirer said about he and Betty Boop? You better ask him yourself. Is that why they shared the screen in Roger Rabbit? Jesus, and I thought Drawn Together was fucked up! But this was on record the first time an animated character was fully visually presented at the awards with Woody Woodpecker, animated by legendary Warner Brothers animator Virgil Ross, who ran across the stage to congratulate his producer, with his voice being done by Gracie Lance, the wife of Walter, and original voice for Woody. While the technology was a little rough and the animation looking more on par with Hanna-Barbera, for 1979, this must have blown people's minds to present animation on live national television in sync to this extent, and I think even for Robin and Walter, their reactions are a little confused, but they still stayed pretty damn improv Hell, this wouldn't be a first for Robin in the many years of his career. Oh, thank you, Mr. Robbins. Mr. Robbins? Taking a stick back, Elmo. <laughs> Actually, speaking of Muppets, 1986 animation was dropped as the presenters for the best animated short with Jim Henson's Kermit the Frog and Scooter. 
This, this is the Academy Awards. Two billion people are watching, and I just got through saying that characters like us can do anything. But aren't these things planned? I mean, this wouldn't happen on the Wheel of Fortune. No! <laughs> Honestly, for a first attempt in 1979 with Woody Woodpecker, it wasn't bad, but clearly it needed more time to finalize. Hence why the Muppets were brought in eight years later. And by 1987, they tried animation again, with Tom Hanks and Bugs Bunny presenting the Best Animated Short Oscar, which went to a Greek tragedy. But just look how they present Bugs for his first onstage appearance. One of the most honored characters in the history of animated cartoons. Not only did this show have a live broadcasted wide shot of Bugs walking on stage, but the interactive technology improved 100% since Woody Woodpecker. And considering the theory of the two being the same person, that's a laugh. I knew it. That's also original voice actor Mel Blanc reprising his role as Bugs Bunny, and it was the first big award night for the then new coming production company Pixar Animation Studios, with Luxo Jr. being one of the nominations. Though their first win wasn't until two years later with Tin Toy, in which the short alone was a prototype for the first computer animated feature, Toy Story. In 1988, as part of his continuing year-long 60th birthday celebration, Mickey Mouse appeared at the Academy Awards ceremony to present the Oscar to the man who planted trees with Donald Duck and... Ooh! Ooh! That's unfortunate. <laughs> Sorry, Donald. Mickey this time around was voiced by Wayne Alwyn, who in my opinion was my personal favorite thanks to the short film The Prince and the Pauper. It's said that the Disney artist had to create two minutes of animation in just three weeks, less than half the time to the work would ordinarily take, which for Disney had to have been a major challenge, especially whenever the nominees were announced. The artist used still photographers of the stage as a guide to when they devised the cartoon action. This was also the first time animated characters were presented sitting with the live action audiences. Oh, and uh, guess who was the presenter with Mickey? I give you my real co-presenter. My very good friend! Hey, that kinda looks like Tom Selleck. Well, to take a break from the original rough tech still in progression, by 1990, the Oscars commissioned Warner Brothers to have Bugs Bunny fully present a short film winner for the character's 50th anniversary. The animation was around the time the Looney Tunes were on their last legs in terms of shorts being presented in theaters, with Box Office Bunny being shown in front of the never-ending story 2. And it's kinda easy to tell that this was done during that short's production. How's this for splitting hairs? 1991, Woody Woodpecker made his second appearance live at the Oscars, this time animated and voiced by Dave Spafford, and presented the award to Nick Park's win for the claymation short Creature Comforts. Nick Park was also nominated in the same category that year for A Grand Day Out, the first appearance of the iconic dogman duo Wallace and Gromit. And in comparisons to his first appearance in 1979, the animation is not only a massive improvement, but crazy as hell good looking, reminding me of the madness you see in, in the wacky world of Tex Avery, which... God, does anybody else remember that show on Cartoon Network? Welcome to the wacky, 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 wacky world. The 1992's Academy Awards was a massive achievement in animation, with Disney's Beauty and the Beast being the first animated feature to be nominated for Best Picture. And who better to present the award for animated shorts that year than the stars of the nominated flick, Belle and the Beast themselves. And... Wait, the Beast needs glasses? You mean to tell me this whole time his rage was caused by limited vision? Maybe Aladdin 4 was meant to be for the Beast! And instead we got Belle's magical world with even worse eyesight! Number one, number two. Anyway, in 1993, the first human cartoon character appeared on stage in a full Oscar dazzle dress with Snow White herself over 50 years since her film was given a special Oscar. Though, unfortunately, some of the jokes are pretty cringe. Here I am, presenting the Academy Award for Best Achievement in Animated Short Films. And as you all know, I've got more than a little experience with short subjects. <laughs> 
The reason for Snow White's appearance was Disney's planned re-release of the film that summer, as well as the upcoming VHS release, and the Oscar show theme that year was Oscar Salute to Women at the Movies. However, there was a small controversy that even though the original voice of Snow White, Andriana K. Slotty, was available, Disney head and petty asshole Jeffrey Katzenberg decided to go for another voice artist for the princess. That, of course, was Mary Kay Bergman, a pretty popular voice actress in the 90s from Gwen Stacy in the 90s Spider-Man cartoon, Daphne on Scooby-Doo, and was the main voice actress for all the female characters in the first few seasons of South Park. By 1995, Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck presented the Oscar for Best Animated Short Film to Allison Snowden and David Fine for Bob's Birthday. Daryl Van Critters directed this sequence with the crew at Warner Brothers Animation. Funny to think that this was a year before Space Jam's massive game changer combining live action with animation. I've already said most of my piece on that particular film. No! No! This was also the last time that hand-drawn animation was presented at the Oscars, because a year later a special Academy Award was given to Toy Story by the film stars Woody and Buzz Lightyear. While Tom Hanks and Tim Allen played the roles respectively, the animation is a tad bit cheaper compared to the film, and it's possible this was a test for Pixar's students in training at the time for both the video games and the Toy Story shorts that would be presented on all the Disney-owned channel Saturday morning blocks. That lassie was always forgetting his toys. He forgot me, too. You've got a friend in me, and you do. There are so many things wrong with those 10 seconds of jokes and presentation. Oh no, honey, don't go there. Way to get canceled even back then, Whoopi. While well, Beavis and Butthead, of all people, presented the Oscars for sound in 1997, God, imagine getting an Oscar from them, 1988 saw the characters of A Bug's Life present the best animated short. Hey, where's Heimlich? <laughs> If they've got that kind of food in the green room, I can't wait to taste what they have at the governor's ball! This was the first time I saw this segment, and as a young imaginative kid, this was pretty mind-blowing, especially since I think A Bug's Life is not only one of my favorite Pixar films, but also really unappreciated. So seeing these characters from a film I thoroughly enjoyed that year on stage live on television was a legitimate intrigue into the balance of animation and reality. Though this was at the time the jokes started to fall at the show's expense. And stepping on the little people is a Hollywood tradition, but please, when you come up to accept your award, just watch your step. Thanks. Why did I laugh at that joke as a kid? The animation once again feels like it was done by Pixar students since Disney was trying to capitalize as much as they could on A Bug's Life with merchandise and even a sing-along tape to promote Animal Kingdom in Florida. By this point, animated characters at award show started to grab my attention as I began binging them whenever they were on, including the likes of the Nickelodeon Kids' Choice Awards, where the Rugrats won multiple times for a few good years. Even the movie won some stuff in 1999. Thank you, everybody, everyone. God, I keep forgetting the Rugrats trilogy was way too good for its time. And even the kids of South Park made a presentation at the Cable Ace Awards. Hey, will you shut your fat mouth for five seconds, Cartman, so we can do this? No way! Shut up, Cartman! The next two years, Pixar did a few more commissions at the Oscars with the cast of Toy Story 2 in 2000, and in 2002, Mike and Sully were guests at the first nomination of Best Animated Feature along with Shrek and Jimmy Neutron, with Shrek overall winning the first award. But some things haven't changed. The Pink Panther still can't adopt in Florida. These jokes are like time travel at its worst. 2003 saw Mickey make his final appearance at the Oscars, now fully formed into CGI, and joined by then Daredevil star Jennifer Garner to present once again the animated shorts. Boy, Mickey seemed to be all over these properties before they bought them out, didn't they? I guess Nathan Lane's jokes stand corrected. Gosh, up until now I thought Monsters Incorporated was a documentary on the Weinsteins. But... <laughs> oh... Hey, it beats this cringy joke. Here it is. Darren Dugu. Good do. Doggone it. How do you say that, Jack? <laughs> Even Jack Nicholson knows this is ridiculous. I don't know whether to laugh or bust a nut. 2005 saw 007's Pierce Bronson and Edna Mode from The Incredibles presenting the nomination for Best Costume Design, and probably due to Edna's character and fashion is why they chose her to present it. 
Nyla's costumes came alive for me. I felt that this is what wearing clothes in Middle Earth must have been. <clears throat> and in 2006, the animated characters to present the best animated short were the characters of Chicken Little and God. Much like the movie, this was a downgrade. Even Will Smith is looking at y'all like, I was in a DreamWorks movie as a scary talking ass fish with a crappy video game and even that was better than this. Screw this, man. I'm going on to YouTube Rewind. By this point, the segments of the show started to run out of steam and it started to become less frequent and even more lazy. 2007's Oscars literally recycled the same skit from 2002's first nominees and even the same joke was made. The Academy rules specify that animated characters must remain in their seats. Only real people can accept the award. So please, be animated. The Academy rules specify that animated characters must remain in their seats. Only real people can accept the award, so please be animated. And in 2008, yes, Barry B. Benson from B-Movie presented an award, and it was... eh. Here's a look at some of my earlier work. my interest in the Oscars began to run dry as the industry and nominations became more disinteresting, disheartening, and quite frankly, really capitalistic and political. So with that in mind, I thought I'd take this opportunity on worldwide television to promote my personal political causes. Please, for the love of Star Command, Tim, don't do it! Sadly, I uh, have no personal political causes. Oh, thank Lightyear! I mean, not just political, but really edgy. It was a big year for paedophile movies. Um, surviving R. Kelly, Leaving Neverland, Two Popes. <laughs> Shut up. Shut up. I don't care. I don't care. Okay, if I know him playing Zartan in G.I. Joe Retaliation, Jonathan Price will fucking nuke you, Ricky! Fifteen in the case of North Korea, just to be sure. Ah, you sons of bitches! While Woody and Buzz returned one last time for Toy Story 3, Ted ripped into everyone when Seth MacFarlane became the last great host of the show, and even the Minions made an appearance. But the final curtain call, in my opinion, for animated characters at the Oscars was with the 2010 animated feature nominations, with the characters being in a cringe interview by iconic 2020 reporter Barbara Walters. We won! We won! Oh, this moment is so much bigger than me. This moment is for all the nameless, faceless gators who came before. Yes, it is just a nomination. <laughs> this isn't gonna end up on YouTube, is it? And honestly, guys, that's all I got with the history of animation at the Oscars. I'm sure there's more out there from several shows and awards, but I mainly wanted to discuss the history of this segment that fascinated me as a young enthusiastic filmmaker, educating myself on all forms of film and entertainment. I guess the reason it became a tradition for a while was more so to entertain the kids and bring in the younger audience. In a way, it did its job, but it's a part of media and animation history that isn't really talked about. So with that said, what's your take on this nostalgic trend? Let us know in the comments below. It's a shame this concept isn't used much anymore, but I can say it left me some inspiration. Check them out and nominate them for yourselves. All of the clips seen in this episode you can probably look for in the internet or find on the Oscars official YouTube channel. So until the next video, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and I'll see you guys later. This is Big Jack Film signing off, saying thank you for watching this Let's Talk, and I'll see you at the movies.